I was saving money and I would just put a, every time I would save a hundred dollars, I would just like pin it up to my my wall in my room, you know, and I had like two thousand like 20 or 30 like pens, you know, and I remember like the uh, the lady that I was running from, she came into my apartment without like asking permission. And then, mm. you know, she was like, why do you have two, th you know, all this money <laughs> pinned on your wall? You know, <laughs> like, well, I have an orphanage in Haiti, you know, like it wasn't. She just thought I was like some drug something. I don't know. Because um, I'm taking care of the kids. <laughs> yeah, it's for the children, you know, yeah. It was <laughs> This is the Beware How Show, mystic philosophy made practical. There are many paths up the mountain, and we're just pointing at a few of them. I'm Bob Peck, speaking with Scott Stanley, Ryan Paget, and Melina Kiriaki. We are conscious creatives and formerly closeted mystics trying to unpack the inaccessible. According to the mystics, the truth cannot be spoken, but we'll try to talk about it anyway. Hi. I'm Bob Peck, and this is the Beware How show, speaking regularly with Scott Stanley, Ryan Paget, and Melina Kiriaki. The Beware How show covers mystic philosophy made practical. We like mindfulness, metaphysics, and non-duality, and a big part of the show is untangling misconceptions about spirituality. Today, our guest is Aaron Jackson of Planting Peace. Thank you for talking with us today, Aaron. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, very good to be here. Thank you for having me. So glad to. I I'm going to laundry list everything you do. It's going to take up half the show, but people need to know. <laughs> um, Aaron is the founder of PlantingPeace.org. It's a nonprofit he started 15 years ago when he was 24, I believe. I didn't confirm that. But oh, is that wow, right, yeah. Matt? The right math? <laughs> uh, yes, it is. Some awesome. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. It's been it like is. this, I'm sure. Yeah, Let crazy. Me, uh, let me read all the stats. To hear, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to like get that information. Um, Planting Peace is a global nonprofit organization founded for the purpose of spreading peace in a hurting world. Their projects focus on a range of humanitarian and environmental initiatives, including a multinational deworming campaign. They've successfully dewormed over 22 million starving children around the world, a network of orphanages and safe havens in developed countries. Aaron runs two orphanages in Haiti and two in India. Uh, they're LGBTQ rights advocates. They uh, run the Equality House and the Transgender House. Uh, they're also doing rainforest conservation efforts in the Amazon. Planting Peace has purchased and protected 2,008 acres of Amazon rainforest and helped to plant over one million trees to help curb deforestation. Um, before, before I pass it over, Aaron's very very active on Facebook. You can donate to Planting Peace on plantingpeace.org or directly on their Facebook page. And this show is about spirituality. Aaron is one of the most tireless humanitarians I'm aware of on planet Earth. Um, and this is probably something we'll be like sledgehammering kind of every aspect today. But the, the combination of social action, social activism, humanitarian work, not being separate from spirituality. And even uh, there's a special connection of Planting Peace's name to a favorite teachers of ours, uh, who, whom, whom we mention often. I'll let Aaron share that. Um, last thing here. I met Aaron through Facebook. Um, it's going to be Aaron talking all day. I just got to finish this. I was working at Facebook in 2016 as a contractor and saw the videos of him um, on the ground at the border of Myanmar deworming child refugees. Um, I reached out and said, please let me advertise your page. I have extra coupons, let's do this. They were already doing advertising, um, but I set up a few more ads, and over the years I've kind of been Aaron's unofficial Facebook help guy. <laughs> um, it's been a huge honor. I've done 1,000 so. of what he does uh, every day, but um, when I was thinking about podcast guests, I just said, let's get Aaron Jackson. Um, so we were, we were laughing about your old uh, Larry King RIP uh, interviews and Anderson Cooper interviews when you were a young CNN humanitarian hero and all that. Um, but yeah, man, I, we just, we wanna hear it all. So, so tell us everything. I mean, even if you wanted to start with the caddy wages and all that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, well, first, uh, thank you for having me. 
And thank you for being my uh, Facebook <laughs> liaison. <laughs> you've, uh, yeah, you've definitely saved me a couple of times. And uh, I really appreciate that. And again, thank you guys for all having me. So I guess I'll just start by how I founded Planting Peace. I, um, so I grew up on a resort in uh, Destin, Florida. My father is a, my stepfather is a professional golfer and my grandfather develops resorts. Um, some of the biggest actually resorts in the United States like uh, Sea Pines and Hilton Head, Amelia Island and San Destin Resort to name a few. So I grew up uh, in the resort world. I grew up on living on a resort and I thought as a child, you know, everybody, everybody like lived like this, you know, everybody, um, you know, it took three, uh, three gates to get to my house. Like I thought everybody, you know, kind of lived like, you know, in this, in this way. And, um, it wasn't until I went off to college and, you know, it was clubbing at night and I started seeing homeless people, you know, in the street. And, you know, that kind of got me thinking like a little bit about homeless people. And I started, you know, doing a little bit here and there to help homeless people. But it really all began when I went to Costa Rica. I flunked out of college uh, three times and that, from the University of Central Florida. And uh, take heart, I, college dropouts. <laughs> yeah, I flunked. Yeah, I. Oh, I mean, this is a show about spirituality. So I should just go ahead and drop this. I did get one credit. Uh, or three credits. Um, I got a D in religion. <laughs> <laughs> I got a D in religion, and uh, yeah, so I finally got that report card with three credits on it. And uh, actually, <laughs> for like that. years Transcript. and years, I yeah, for years and years, I was telling people I passed, like giving talks around the country. I'd be like, yeah, I got one credit, and then one of my friends was like, you know, you got three credits for that, right? And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> I've been shorting myself two credits this whole time. Um, you academic. Yeah, so I got, yeah. So, uh, yeah, D in religion. Um, pretty, pretty stoked about that. But the, uh, um, so, yeah, I went to Costa Rica with my uh, then girlfriend. And uh, during that trip, we were just living in Costa Rica. She had also dropped out. And we were just living in Costa Rica for a while. And I met this family that was living in a container and in the, in the woods. And they invited me to uh, have, uh, have dinner with them. And that dinner with them, just seeing how they lived really like impacted me. And I was lost. I was for sure like a lost soul, you know, like what am I gonna do in the world? You know, I'm 20 years old, roughly. I flunked out of college three times. Everybody's kind of looking down on me. If, 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 whether they were or not, it felt that way. And um, yeah, just very, very confused and what to do. And I'm sure, you know, everybody goes, everybody goes through that. And, or, and uh, anyways, but that it really impacted me, you know, like, oh, that I should do something. And um, I came back and I decided to open up a nonprofit. Um, but, but before that, before mm -hmm. I opened the nonprofit, I had made a phone call uh, to a, um, I just Googled like how to help homeless people. And I made a phone call to a guy named Michael Stoops. This was actually in college and that I made this phone call. And uh, Michael Stoops, I didn't under realize this at the time, but I just Googled like how to help homeless people. And, and this guy named Michael Stoops popped up. I gave him a call. Well, it turns out he was the ho homeless czar of the United States. He was the, the president of the National Coalition for the Homeless. And, you know, I didn't know that. And he doesn't receive phone calls unless, hey, I'd like to volunteer at my local type shelter type thing, you know. <laughs> no one had ever called him for like, like thing. So I had uh, called him and he kind of just took a liking to me because I was this very bizarre person that, you know, for whatever reason, <laughs> never received a call like that. So uh, he put me in contact with a gentleman named Sean Canoni who is one of the uh, best advocates for homelessness in the United States. Uh, he ran the largest uh, homeless shelter in the United States that's not government funded. And um, in, uh, kind of like a radical with money. So people had to pay attention to him. And um, but, so when I got back to the United States, I called Michael Stoops again and said, hey, I'm about to open a nonprofit. Um, you know, I'd like to help homeless people in the United States. And he said, oh, before you do that, let me put you in contact with Sean again. 
And um, so I was able to get an internship with a, the, a charity named The Homeless Voice. And I ended up working for them for a couple of years uh, with the internship and worked my way out. By, by the time I was actually uh, done with the organization, I was the director of the nonprofit. And um, probably like two and a half years. But then during that trip, during that trip, I went to Haiti. I was driving to work one day and I heard about a famine going on in Haiti. Now, I was living in, you know, South Florida. Miami and Fort Lauderdale has a lot of Haitians. Haiti is a big, big uh, issue in Haiti. I mean, I'm sorry, in, in Southern Florida. Over one million Haitians live in so South Florida. So they were talking about this famine going on in Haiti. And because I was the director of the, of the homeless shelter, I was able to get food from the food bank at 16 cents a pound, which I believe comes out to, I could be wrong, but I think it comes out to $320 a ton. So for one ton of food, I could buy for $320. It doesn't matter what kind of food it is. They just weigh it, you know, it could be rice, it wow. could be steak. So I decided in my mind, you know, being a little naive, um, I decided, oh, I'm gonna ship 100 tons of food to Haiti. But this was beyond the realm of what the homeless shelter did. I mean, they worked in the United States, not Haiti. So I wrote, uh, I don't know how many churches, but my girlfriend at the time, her and I, we wrote probably, I would say somewhere between like 300 to 1,000 churches or something like that, uh, asking them to sponsor one mm. ton of food, you know, and it was kind of like, oh, if we all do this, you know, collectively we could do this, you know, and one, only one church in Alabama responded and they sponsored two tons of food. And mm. I would do anything <laughs> in the world to know who this church was to go back in time and just remember who this church was because this church plays like a huge aspect in my story because that church well ended up being that like you know i couldn't do what i thought i was going to do you know i didn't understand mm -hmm. that like you know i just thought hey there's a famine i could just call the government I up or whoever the hell you call. i can get this yeah, food over here's a hundred here's a hundred <laughs> tons of food you know and yeah. they're gonna take it gracefully and we'll just sing Kumbaya by the campfire, you know, like I, that was my world, my very naive world, you know? And, um, I remember calling like, you know, a guy that worked in Haiti and he was just like, no, like, that's like, did you get import? Are you ready to pay? You know, that's going to cost about 50,000 in taxes. You know, he started, you know, like my world just started crumbling. Customs and yeah, yeah. 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 And then he was on top of it. He was like, and it's just not happening. Like you're not getting that. You know, you're not getting that food in here. Well, and then it didn't really matter because people didn't sponsor the 100 tons of food, you know. But I did have this 600, $640. And, you know, I was like, well, I got to do something with it. You know, they gave me the money. I'm going to help Haiti with this $640. <laughs> and then that person that I ended up talking to, the Haitian gentleman that I ended up talking to, he was like, you know, there's this charity called MAP International where you can buy medicine from them for, you know, like a bottle of amoxicillin is like one penny, two pennies, you know, and you can buy medicine with them and you can use that money, you know, or whatever, whatever money, you, you know, to buy medicine. So I ended up contacting them and they had these like travel packs for like $400, you know, they would treat 700 people. So I ended up buying like these true travel packs. And I had a friend, um, childhood friend who's older than me, who is a doctor. And I remember when I was a kid, I was sitting at the dinner table and he had just became a doctor. And I remember him saying, you know, to my family that he wanted to, before he opened up his practice, that he wanted to travel to Africa and um, help children and, or if he should do that, or if he should um, open up his practice first. And my family convinced him to open up his practice first, that that would be the better route. And I didn't have an opinion at the dinner table, but I remember <laughs> sitting there just kind of thinking like, this is messed up. Like the guy just wants to help, you know? And, um, but I remember that. Africa. it stuck with me for whatever reason. Yeah. So I called him, you know, and I was like, Hey, uh, Chuck, you know, I remember you said this like six years ago at the dinner table. <laughs> I don't know if you remember saying this or not, but you did. And he was like, yeah, I do remember that obviously. And I was like, well, I'm going to go to Haiti if you want to tag along with me. And he took a chance. And he took a chance and he went with me and we ended up and we ended up uh, going to City Soleil, Haiti, which is a slum within Port-au-Prince, about uh, roughly like 400,000 people live in this slum. And it is uh, the Catholic Church considers 
the worst like poverty in the world. You have a 50% chance of reaching the age of four. So it's really, really bad due to like starvation, oh tuberculosis, things of that nature. And so we went to this, uh, you know, uh, we went, I went to the uh, city Soleil and we started treating people. And on that trip, I, I had a translator named John Devon and he translated for the doctor and he was just like this amazing amazing person and on this trip unfortunately like everybody was taking advantage of me like everybody i had a fair amount of money at my disposal and everybody was just uh just really really just taking advantage of me to, to give one example is the they came to us the pastor came to us and said i would would like you to feed everybody that you're treating of course i'm like of course everybody's starving i'll be more than happy to like provide a meal and they were like okay to feed everybody for these three days of uh, practice you know doing your <laughs> clinic it would be uh two thousand dollars so i'm like okay well they ended up only buying a 50 pound mm -hmm. bag of rice and a 50 pound bag of beans so you know i've definitely probably no one has ever spent more on rice and beans than me, you know, I probably <laughs> hold that record. And, but I didn't know that at the time, you know, I just learned that later, but that's just one example of how everybody yeah. was taking advantage of me and, and my crew. And, you know, they would come to me and be like, Hey, can I get a little more money? Or, you know, they would say these things. And then I would find out at the dinner that night, you know, that they were asking somebody else for, you know, also the same, you know, got a hundred from them and a hundred from them, you know, but there was this one guy named John DeBond, and we ended up taking a uh, a break together, you know, and a uh, water break together in the room. And we actually struck up a conversation about Jesus in that break. And now I'm not religious at all, but I read, uh, you know, I've always just had a uh, strong, you know, uh, inclination towards Jesus. Just like I like reading about Jesus and, you know, among like all He's the a compassionate prophets. guy. Yeah, you know, I just like, um, I, I just really like what he has to say, whether, you know, I, I could care less whether Jesus is a real person or not. But, you know, I just, I just agree with like, you know, feed the hungry and these, you know, the, the, the core principles, I, I guess. And I met this gentleman named John DeBond, and we just struck up this conversation. And he was kind of basically, you know, telling me his theory of how like Jesus was a radical. And, you know, I just really agreed with him. And he was a, pa he was a pastor. John is a pastor, and uh, and then he told me during that break how he wanted to help homeless orphan children. That he wanted to help orphan children, and uh, but not like an orphanage, but like uh, where he like gives them um, uh, like a uh, like a place where they could like a drop-in center. I would say like where they can come in and take showers and play games and get some education, just you know feel loved in some shape or form. And uh, you know he was telling me about his vision and. Uh, and I was like, oh, man, that's incredible. Well, um, you know, so he went back to his thing. I went back doing the, my doing my thing. And then at the end of the on my on my very last day of the trip, um, John came up to me about an hour before the, the the clinic was over. And he was like, Aaron, I'm very sorry, but I have to leave a little early. I don't know if anyone told you this. And uh, but I had a previous engagement. And this is when everybody's like, hey, can I get a little extra money? You know, like, and he just said, thank you so much for helping my people. I really appreciate everything you've done here. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. And then he never asked for a thing. And that night at the dinner table, I was in a hotel and I was talking to everybody. We were kind of going over how everybody screwed us. We were talking about the good things, but also like, man, we really got screwed by some of these people that set this up. And I was just like, man, the only person that didn't take advantage of us was this John guy. And he was so incredible. And there was just something about him. And, uh, and I remember saying, specifically, I remember saying, I wish I would have given him something like a tip or something i was like that's the person that really deserves something <laughs> and i kid you not um not three minutes after i made that comment i looked over to my right and john was sitting at the dinner table next to me you know in this in this hotel and that is actually <laughs> where his engagement was you know like oh he had gosh. an event at this hotel and i was just like holy cow so i went up to him and i went up to john and i said john you know you know, we gave each other hugs and, mm -hmm. you know, he's like the friendliest person. And I was like, I think mm -hmm. it was 50 bucks I gave him or a hundred dollars. It doesn't matter. But I gave him a tip and 
and I told him thank you and I got his phone number and that changed everything because probably like I don't know how much time had passed but I would say probably like four or five months later Christmas was coming up I still haven't left the homeless shelter I was working at and Christmas was coming up and I called him and I said, Hey, I have a little bit of money. Um, can you buy Christmas gifts for all the homeless children in the street? If I send you, if I Western union, you some money. And he was like, sure. So I sent him $300, not that much money, but you know, I sent him $300 and he was like, Oh, I'll take pictures for you. And not to post on social media or anything. You know, I didn't even have a charity yet. He was just like, just to prove that you, yeah, I did it. Well, I sent him the three hundred dollars, and come, um, you know, come uh, Christmas Day, I never heard from him. And then the day after Christmas, I never heard from him. And I remember uh, saying to Corinne, my girlfriend at the time, like, "Oh man, like, I wonder if this guy like screwed us, you know? <laughs> like, did he uh, like, like what? Everybody happened? else, did, yeah, did like, my well, one I sincere maybe guy. He, yeah. Maybe he wasn't that good, you know? Right. Like, anyways, well." Either on like the 27th or the 28th of December, I get a email from him and it's the email and he says, Hey, sorry, the internet connection was really bad. You know, it's Haiti and that's true. You know, I didn't know these things at the time, you know, but that's true. And he was like, also, um, I didn't, I know I said I was going to buy Christmas gifts for, um, um, for on Christmas and give to the kids. But he's like, then I thought about it and he was like, you know, if I buy the gifts on the 26th, all the presents were cheaper, you know, like the costs were half. So he was like, I was able, so he's like, I went and actually bought Christmas gifts on the 26th and I was able to double the amount of gifts we gave out. <laughs> and I, and, and then he showed me this picture of, you know, hundreds of kids receiving, you know, like a gift from wow. him. And I was like, wow, that was like, Hey, wow, he did it. So I was like, you know, and I like was shedding a tear and you know, all the above, like, this is really, really incredible. And uh, that he did that and that he was thinking, you know, like, that's so smart. Economical, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like the economics of it, that was very, very smart, you know, and uh, and um, anyways, so I would say, so that's what really, um, you know. That, so that created and I, your connection to Haiti. He, and That's really what really, things. you know, like sealed that bond between him and I. And then yeah. I would say about another three months later, I was in New York, still working for the nonprofit. I was told to put together a protest in New York City and I ended up uh, quitting, you know, quitting the, the abruptly quitting the the charity that I was working for and uh, just due to a simple misunderstanding. And um, I ended up quitting the charity and the person that runs that charity, actually I'm staying, staying in his building now. We're still best of friends. Um, yeah, I'm actually in a homeless shelter right now. It's a hotel, but it's a homeless shelter. It's a motel eight that he bought into a homeless shelter. And uh, it's randomly just up the street from my dog rescue. So it's very, yeah, very bizarre. But anyways, um, um, so him and I had a falling out, like a little bit of a falling out in that moment. And uh, I remember like sitting in my uh, Manhattan apartment, laying on the floor at two or three in the morning, staring at the roof, just being like, what the F am I going to do? You know, I don't have a job, you know? And then it hits me, it hits me like that he wants, it hits me that conversation about him wanting that John guy wanting to help orphan children, you know, that water break conversation. So I called him you know, out of the blue. And it wasn't like we were like maintaining some great relationship or anything. You know, we just had that Christmas thing. And I probably, probably hadn't even talked to him since then. And I called him and I said, hey, John, I'm gonna open up my own nonprofit. Um, would you like to do this with me? And I remember you telling me about orphan children, you know, and I was like, what if we, you know, change that into an orphanage? And he was like, yeah, that's a great idea. And, uh, and I was like, all right, I'll try to raise the money on this side and you can, you know, you can run it on your side. And so, and that's what, and, you know, and that's exactly what we did. I started saving money. I started Western Union and money. Um, my girlfriend at the time, her name is Corinne and, um, uh, you know, we're not together anymore, but she's still a board member of Planting Peace. And at the time, uh, Corinne's mother had just passed away and left her some money. So Corinne, you know, gave some money that gave us a little bit of money to open up the, the nonprofit. And 
we started, you know, so we, we basically just rented a home. And the way I looked at it is like, you know, a lot of nonprofit, and this is how I've looked at kind of my, my philosophy on everything, but like a lot of charities, and I'm not saying they do it wrong and I do it right. This isn't like, I'm, I'm not trying to say that at all, but a lot of, I'll yeah, a lot, a, a lot of charities will be like, um, you know, we have to, in order to start an orphanage, we need to raise, we need to have 500,000 in the bank. You know, we need to buy the we need to buy the building, and we need to have twenty thousand a month coming in for steady income. You know, and that's what we need to to start the orphanage. It prevents a where, lot of action, probably. It, exactly right? yeah. where I where I, where I was looking at it, where I was like, well, the kids already live in the street. You know, so if I put them in a home, we're already raising the bar. We're already right, raising right. the bar. And if I put them around somebody that's loving and that they can trust, mm -hmm. that's also raising the bar. So even if we don't have food or not, even if we, they already don't have that. So that's kind of how, you know, that was kind of my philosophy and how I was looking at it. So like money, plus I was very young. And you know how, I mean, you know, when you're young and it's like, oh, you can just, conquer the world sometimes when i look at you know i reflect on that i'm like wow i was nuts like i can't even believe i did that you know <laughs> but uh you know as i get um a little bit older but but um yeah i love your yeah. like purity of like diy like everything is like diy sincerity like you know <laughs> your whole career it's just making this work how can i make yeah. this work and um, yeah and that's exactly and then, you about, know and then yeah. he yeah. And he called me and he called me and he was like, Hey, you know, I got a kid, you know, we, we have a kid in the place and you know, it's oh. like, Holy shit, got one this kid. is real. You know, like this is, yeah, this is very, very real. You know, like this is happening. And I remember calling people and be like, I have an orphanage in Haiti. And they're like, okay, Aaron, <laughs> whatever the hell that means. And I'm like, no, like I have a place like an orphanage in Haiti. And they're just like, yeah. You know, and, um, so, One orphan so I lives actually, in it. <laughs> I, yeah, so I didn't, um, I actually didn't name my charity Planting Peace at first. I named it the Chick Grant Foundation, which was my grandfather is named Charles Grant, and everybody called him Chick. And like, you know, my family has, a, comes from money, and everybody around us comes from money. So in my world, how my perspective is like, oh, I'll name it after my grandfather, someone I admire and respect. And, um, and then I'll also utilize that, you know, to raise capital. And then it just wasn't happening. No one gave. And and then I got stuck with people be like, Chick Grant Foundation, like hmm. chicken, you know, like you help people would always ask me <laughs> like help chickens. Like, it was just a mess, you know. I'm like, no, no, like we help orphans, mm -hmm. you know. It, it was it was a branding nightmare. Mistake. You know? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, and uh, and then on top of it, you know, my I didn't get any money from anybody, so it didn't it didn't matter, and because uh, no one was believing in it, you know, unfortunately, and um, and I don't, you know, necessarily blame them. I mean, these are the same people that saw me like flunk school multiple times, <laughs> and you know, tried many times. Like <clears throat> I, I, you know, don't I don't want to like villainize them for you know not supporting me, um, because that's not the case. Like. I probably wouldn't have supported myself either, you know, <laughs> but the, um, anyways, um, yeah, so we started, you know, we started that orphanage and I didn't have a income coming in. So I started, um, caddying at a golf course and, um, and I actually made really, really good money. You know, I grew up in golf. I understood golf. I knew golf. So I started caddying at a golf course in North Miami beach called presidential country club. And I, you know, for a simple job, I made a lot of money, you know, considering they paid me eight, eight dollars an hour and I would make somewhere between like 70 to 200 dollars a day in tips. Mm. So wow. for for non-educated job, it was really good, you know. So um, and I use that money. And what I would do is I was I would keep the eight dollars an hour to pay my rent and um and uh and by the way and so i was living in this, i was living in this 
tiny little beach apartment in Aventura, Florida. If anybody knows what Aventura is, it's right in between um, Miami and Fort Lauderdale. It's this tiny little Jewish community. It's so tiny. And um, I mean, once you're in it, you're out of it. And I was living in this little beach condo and uh, with Corinne, just, uh, uh, it was like an old hotel and a two story hotel. And we were just surrounded by million dollar, you know, uh, condos and whatnot. And one day uh, I got a knock on the door and they were like, Trump bought the building. You gotta be out in one month. <laughs> wow. Uh, <clears throat> so my point to that little side is like, yeah, Trump, Trump has been screwing me over for like quite a while. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, so since the early so, days. Yeah, since the early days, and um, yeah, so um, so you know, I had to, we had to like move out of that apartment, but I was using that eight dollars an hour, and I would take like ten to twenty dollars a day to support Corinne and myself. And, um, you know, our expenditures were very low. It was just like, you know, rice and beans and marijuana were like our two main <laughs> and, um, and then literally I would take $80, $100, $130, and I would just Western Union it to John. And um, just constant Western Unions. Like every two, three, or four days, I would send oh. like, here's 80 bucks, here's 200 bucks, here's $300, just constantly. I got a big tip and, from uh, a guy. And this wasn't me. <clears throat> this wasn't being registered, you know, like I wasn't going through like planting like or at the time the Chick Grant Foundation. I wasn't like depositing the money into an account and then wiring it off like all official. No, you know, I remember that I was saving money and I would just put a, every time I would save a hundred dollars, I would just like pin it up to my my wall in my room, you know, and I had like two thousand like 20 or 30 like pens you know and i remember like the uh the lady that i was renting from she came into my apartment without like asking permission and then mm. you know she was like why do you have two th you know all this money <laughs> pinned on your wall you know <laughs> like well i have an orphanage in haiti you know like it wasn't <laughs> she just thought i was like some drug something i don't know um because i'm taking care of the kids <laughs> yeah it's for the children you know yeah it was definitely yeah, not so um, good. yeah. So you've so, upgraded so, um, your operations a little bit since then, and it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, but where Still it where grassroots. It, yeah, so yeah, very grassroots. But where it really got real is one of the kids I was caddying with. He came from money as well, and he had a drug issue. So his parents kind of, um, you know, forced him on to you know like do it by himself. And he came to me one day. He was the person I was catting with constantly, you know. And he was like, Aaron, um, I t just so you know, like, this is my dad runs this hedge fund. And he has, like, a lot, a lot of money. And he has a lot of connections. And I told him, I was like, I told him that, you know, I walk, I've been catting with you for, like, six months, a year, however long it's been. And I told him that you just don't shut the hell up about orphan children, you know, that you're always going on <laughs> and on about these kids living in the streets of Haiti. And I told him about it, and he said that he would um, help you sponsor an orphanage in Haiti, another orphanage in Haiti. So I was like, again, you know, very naive, and I was like, holy shit, I'm, I got another sponsorship from an orphanage. I wasn't even worrying about, like, getting a sponsorship for the one I had. I just saw it as, like, helping another, like, opening up another home, because I could pretty much handle the home. I, yeah, it was kind of a struggle, but I could handle, the, you know, the orphanage that I had. And um, and no money was coming in, like zero dollars from outside sources. It was literally just me, and and Corinne, you know, helping us. Uh, like like I said, from the money that she inherited from her mother. Well, so I called John. We opened up a second orphanage, and this one was for children living with HIV. You know, I told him like I want to help kids with a that have HIV, and uh, he's like, okay, we can do that. Haiti has some. Uh, Haiti has the worst HIV epidemic in the Western Hemisphere, so he. <laughs> So he, um, so we did it. He went to uh, UNESCO, which is Cornell University. They have the largest, the first HIV hospital in the world. It's called UNESCO. It's in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, run by Cornell University. And he went to them and he was like, do you have children that like, that need help that would die otherwise if they don't have housing? And they were like, of course we do. And they started giving us children with HIV. Well, so I opened the home and then I went back to my friend and I was like, all right, I did it. 
you know, I got this home orphan, this home opened, and he was just basically like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, you know, it was more of just like, he, he just didn't come through, you know? And I had now two orphanages in Haiti without funding. And this was a very, 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 very big problem, you know? And I could barely afford that. But you know, once I've taken in the children, so like, what do you do? You know, like, I'm not gonna take in a child and not give that and, and put that child back into the street. You know, like I would never do that. And, um, you know, not without exhausting all possibilities. And um, well, so it just so happened that uh, around that time, my girlfriend and I, Corinne, we had just broke up. And um, so I was living by myself. And I, you know, I used to be the director of the homeless shelter. And so I called that shelter and uh sean and i was like hey sean i was like this is what's happening like i can't afford both but i'm not going to give up on this orphanage and he was like all right well i can um, i have extra spare in the office at the homeless shelter uh so you can just move in here and and try to run your home try to run uh, your charity from the homeless shelter so i was like okay that's what i'll do so i ended up actually living in the homeless shelter i moved into the shelter and i ended up living in this shelter for probably Um, four, I ended up living there for like three to four years, um, living, living, living in the homeless shelter, supporting these two orphanages. Sending the tips to the orphanages. Yeah. Still working. Yeah. Still working at the home, still working at the golf course. And then, and then one day I was accused of, um, golf clubs kept coming up missing at the golf course. Someone was stealing golf clubs and it was only happening on my watch. For whatever reason, every time it was my shift, you know, I don't know if you know this or not, but golf clubs are very, very expensive. Yeah. And, and you know, a, a set of like my clubs are like twenty five hundred dollars, and that's just a normal set. And the course thought I had something to do with it, and they fired me. And uh, you know, I was like, holy cow, like what do I do here? You know, like, you know, I'm I'm already living in a homeless shelter. I can't go any like further down. Lower into the poverty realm and you have to remember at this time i didn't have a social media following i didn't have um uh, i've never done an interview mm-hmm. no one knows that i even have an orphanage in haiti you know like it was just me doing this for years and um the guy that owned the homeless i mean that runs you know the president of the homeless shelter he has a lot of money and he was like his name is sean he's one of my best friends again this is where i'm, I'm staying at his his shelter right now in his hotel motel, his motel eight that he owns. And he, uh, he said to me, he was like, well, Aaron, I've seen you do this for like two years now, two or three years. You've been living here. You go to work every day and you just send your money and you've never done one thing to build your charity up. You've never done a fundraiser. You've never done, you know, you've never done anything. And, uh, and he was like, I'll give you the money. He was like, how much does it cost to run these two orphanages? And I was like, well, roughly like $3,000, $100 a day, I could pull it off. And he was like, okay, I'll give you the $100 a day. And you try to start building up your, this chick grant foundation, <laughs> you know? And I was like, okay, perfect. And um, um, well, about like four or five days later, they called me and they had caught the person that had like stole they figured it out. Actually, I don't remember if they caught the person, but they figured it out that it wasn't me, long mm-hmm. story short. And they offered me my job back. And I told Sean that I was like, hey, they gave me my job back. Um, and he was like, don't take it. I would rather you just give you the $3,000 a funds. month. And yeah, he's like, I'd rather just give you the $3,000 a month and you learn how to build your own nonprofit. And this was in my story. This is also one of the biggest blessings that Mm. someone could have ever offered me, you know, because no one believed in me at that time, except him, no one. So basically like I was living in the shelter and all of a sudden a reporter had called me from, uh, are you guys familiar with like uh, the village voice in New York city? Have you ever heard of that newspaper? And a reporter from new times called me and he was like, um, I, I, someone had told me that, you know, you're like living in a homeless shelter (laughs) and you have two orphanages in Haiti. Like, is this true? And I was like, yeah, this, this is, is true. And he was story. like, well, I'd like to follow you around and do a story on that. 
yeah, he was like, I would like to do a story on this. And, um, but I have to fact check it first, you know, like I'm going to fly to Haiti and I'm going to see if you have these orphanages. So like, are you like telling the truth that you really have this? And it's like, and it's not that I was lying to anybody at this time. I don't even think Facebook was a thing. So it wasn't even like, I was like, support me or anything like this you know oh. i mean maybe facebook was a thing but i don't remember it being a thing i didn't even have anyone to lie to basically you know? <laughs> no one was listening to me regardless <laughs> but uh um, so i don't even really know how he found out but uh anyway so he he flew to haiti you know and he came to haiti and he um he did you know he he did this he did the story which he embarrassingly called the the title of the story was called saint aaron <laughs> and it was a tight, you know, it was on the, um, it was on the cover, it was on the cover, and Ardo, uh, the other Village Voice media picked it up, ran the story, wow. and then all of a sudden, like, you know, money started pouring in, not pouring in, but like, wow, like, this is where I kind of got my first, you know, donations, and, um, you know, and, 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 and yeah. And, um, uh, and you know, the so initial that's, launch. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. That's, that's basically how, yeah. Like that's how it basically like, that's basically how planting these got started. <clears throat> wow. That's amazing. I'm sure we all have questions. Um, <laughs> that's funny because that's like literally 3% of your whole journey because you've been in Myanmar, uh, at the border, you've been in Mexico, you've been all over the world. Um, but happy to see if anybody else wants to jump in. Yeah, um, uh, that's just an absolutely incredible story. And thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us, um, how that all came to be. I One of my first questions coming into this was just, I was just curious on some of the struggles that you face getting to where you are. So <laughs> everything you just shared completely filled me in mm -hmm. on all of that. I, I can only imagine that it's what you're doing did not come easy and it probably took a really long time um, to yeah. kind of get to where you are. And, and I think so. a lot of people, especially a lot of people think like, oh, you can raise some money so fast now. And, you know, mm -hmm. we have 5 million people that follow us on social media and like it, it's, um, you know, people forget there was road. like, yeah, I mean, and I get that. But, you know, people forget there was like literally five years where no one, no one literally living in a homeless shelter, you yeah. know, wiring money, Western <laughs> Union style. And, um, you know, and it was really and, and that really didn't change. You know, I'd also in that during that time, I had started deworming kids and um you know, deworming, if anybody doesn't know, you know, I'm sure, well, most people are very familiar with like deworming dogs, you know, getting a tapeworm out of a dog, a penworm, you know. Um, so uh, on one of my um, trips to Haiti, I was uh, sitting in, in the countryside of Haiti with John, you know, the guy I co-founded Planting Peace with. And I asked him, I was like, hey, why do all these children have distended bellies? And he was like, worms. You know, and I was like, worms, like, like, what the hell does that mean? Worms? What do you mean they have worms in their belly? You know, like That's that terrible. disgusted me. I promise I had never even heard of that. Actually, probably at the time, I'd probably never even known. Like, maybe I knew dogs had worms or something. I don't even know what I knew, but I definitely didn't know that children had worms. You yeah. know, that really disgusted me. I was like, wait a minute, these worms in these kids' bellies? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, and I asked him, I was like, well, how much does it cost to treat a child of worms? And he was like, $20. And I was like, okay. I was like, well, that's not bad, $20 to get worms out of you, you know? Well, like an hour later, or, or maybe, I don't remember, but a very short period of time later, I, I went into my pant pockets, like some old pants. This is in Haiti, again, in the countryside of Haiti. And I pulled out a $20 bill. And this is and and this pulling this bill out really also has transformed my life yeah. because I went to I was like well I'm gonna pretend like I never even found this twenty dollars you know like I'm not gonna keep this twenty dollars so I told John I was like hey John I found twenty bucks let's deworm a kid you know I was all about it and uh, he was like okay he was like pick one and every child in Haiti like literally nine out of ten has a, a very distended belly. And for, the, and for those that don't know, and I didn't understand this at the time, but the distended belly comes from a protein deficiency. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so 
and you know, and parasites eat roughly 24, 20 to forty percent of a child's nutritional intake every day. So, um, you know, that, that that's what, why those two are correlated. And uh, anyways, um, I picked a child and I deworm. And and the twenty dollars was not just for like the medicine. The twenty dollars, you know, things in Haiti are cheap cheaper it was to pay for the medicine it was to pay for the doctor but the nearest doctor was an hour and a half away so we had to pay for the child to get on like a cab type thing and go see a doctor in the nearest village the nearest town and uh, so he estimated at twenty dollars so i gave a lady twenty dollars i picked a child a random child and the mother as i was leaving that village the next day literally as i was leaving the mother came up to me crying and she was like Thank you so much, my child. Um, the doctor said my child would have died due to intestinal uh, cl parasite cloggage in the intestines. And if this mother would have never came up to me, I don't know if I, I, I probably would have never, maybe never thought about deworming again. I don't know. Of course, I don't know how life would have played out, but it really got me thinking, you know, like this lady, like impacting this lady and, you know, crying and seeing her child sick and her child was really sick. And um, and uh, so I went home and uh, went back to the United States and I hit the old Google and I found this gentleman named Claude Good, who is a missionary in Mexico, a, a Mennonite who lived in Pennsylvania. But he was, um, you know, he was he was like 80 at the time. So he was kind of but he he ran this charity called the Worm Project. And he was like, hey, Aaron, he was like, you know, nice to meet you. And da 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 da. And I was like, I can sell you a pill, actually. Uh, to treat these kids for five cents and 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 fight a one pill it's only one pill and it's five cents and it can rid the child of worms and i was like wow i was like that's a lot better than twenty dollars you know so i ended up buying and i could buy pills directly off of him so i ended up buying twenty thousand doses of medication and now it's that might sound like a lot but it's just a tiny pill so I could put the pills in my backpack and I started sneaking the wow. pills into Haiti. Oh my God. You know, <laughs> like anytime I'd go visit, anytime I'd go to my orphanage, I would just um, sneak the pills in my backpack. And, uh, and then I would go into a village and just start deworming kids. And uh, again, it's just one pill. You give it to them. It doesn't matter if uh, it's called all benzodol or my benzodol. There's two types. And uh, it's a very strong dose. And this pill was directly made for aid work. So if you were to catch a worm in the United States, your doctor would probably try to figure out what type of worm parasite it was. And then he'd be like, okay, I'm gonna put you on 50 milligrams twice a day for four days. But this pill is, a, is again, just used for aid work. So you can go into a village, it's a very, very strong dose, but absorbs very slowly. You give it to the child and um, 24 hours, 48 hours later, worms start passing through, usually through the stool, sometimes through the mouth but um, mostly mostly through the stool. And it works. I mean, like worms just start clearing out. The, the medicine doesn't kill the worms. It makes it toxic for the body. So the worms are like, I got to get the hell out of here and find a new host. So, mm -hmm. and that's why they pass uh, through the stool. Um, so, so, um, so I started doing that. And, uh, and then one day Claude called me and he was like, hey, Aaron, um, I just got a grant to deworm one million children in Haiti. And I could go through these other big relief organizations or I could go through you, the one who is always calling, asking for more, you know. And uh, I was like, mm -hmm. he's like, Finding he didn't handle it. And I was like, yeah, that's going to be a lot of backpacks. But uh, he was like, don't worry. He was like, don't worry. I'll um, I'll. Um, I'll ship it in for you, you know, like I'll help you get mm -hmm. it through because I didn't yes. really understand how to do that at that time, you know, and I went to some people after that. And unfortunately, I went to some people and I raised another 700,000 doses of medication. You know, I went to some people and I was like, it's kind of funny people. I mean, I think you all will understand this. People want to be a part of a moving train. No one wants to get on a train that's not moving. People want to be on a train that's moving. So for me to raise a million doses was impossible. But once I got the million doses, it was easy to raise 700,000. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So so now I had 1.7 million doses of deworming medication. And and so I started deworming, you know, Haitians with this 1.7. And around that time, and it started making news that I was doing that. Some people followed that story. 
And then I got a random phone call from CNN. And CNN was like, and I've only had the New Times coverage and maybe some local coverage in South Florida, you know, the South Florida Sun Sentinel, but I'd never expanded outside of, you know, South Southern Florida. And, you know, so CNN called me and they were like, hey, we have this new thing called CNN Heroes that we're doing. It's, uh, it's new. No one knows of it. Um, and we read your story and we were wondering if you would be considering, considering, you know, consider being a CNN hero. And I was like, of course, I don't know. I don't even know what the hell that is, but it's CNN and I need media coverage. You know, mm -hmm. I need people focusing. And they were just like, so can you tell us everything that you do? And so I told them, you know, everything we do. And then I wouldn't hear from CNN. And then like two or three weeks later, I'd get a random phone call. And then they were like, can you tell us again? And but this person is going to be on the line, you know, and and I kept just doing I was going through like this interview process, you know, and then all of a sudden one day I, you know, probably like six months later or something. It wasn't right away. I get a random phone call from CNN and they were like, hey, um, we reviewed um I think 20,000 people, I think it was 20,000 people around the world. And we narrowed down to 12 of who we think are making the biggest impact in the world. Oh my goodness. And um, you've been picked, you know, would you like to be this, you know, CNN hero? And I was like, sure. Again, you know, now we know what CNN heroes is, or a lot of people do. But, you know, at the time, there was, it had never even aired before. It was a new, this new concept created by CNN. So, and that's a, and that's really big because what I'm about to say, I got picked and I remember I was the second CNN hero. I think I was the second one and, um, CNN said to me on the first person that, yeah, CNN said to me on the first person that had become a CNN hero, they were like, Hey, we just want to let you know, like it did really well for this person. Like it changed their life. So they CNN sent in like this like little team to help me prepare they were like is your website going to be able to handle mm -hmm. the web page is your you know like they were like helping me because they were like mm -hmm. it's a really big thing you know That's like awesome. even for us like it, it was incredible so 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 cnn um told me that uh they were like but with you we're going to also do a written article for cnn.com and i was like okay so they entered me for that cnn you know dot com interview and and then I never, uh, and then they contacted me like three days later and they said, oh, forget the CNN.com article. We're just going to run your, uh, you know, you, you on just regular air, like on Anderson Cooper or something. And I was like, okay. And then one day I was like three in the afternoon. I usually go to bed late and I wake up, you know, I wake up at like 12, one in the afternoon normally. And, um, or it used to. And I remember waking up in bed at like, at one in the morning, I mean, I'm sorry, one in the afternoon. And I, I checked my phone and my phone was just filled with messages like to the brim, like, and it was like, it couldn't accept any more messages. And I was like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and I just randomly that day had a t article come out about me in the Miami Herald. And I was like, mm -hmm. damn, they must've really wrote something good, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I like went and read that Miami art, you know, like Harold article and I was like I don't understand like why would this article like do so well you know like then I went logged into my email and 2,000 people had emailed me and I was like wow like damn you know like this article must have gone everywhere and then that and I was just like and I, I didn't open up any of the emails and then I out of the 2,000 randomly enough one of the top emails with a guy named Sam Eipling who's a reporter friend of mine and uh, a friend outside of being a reporter. And I opened his email up and it said, man, I was really surprised to see you on the featured on CNN.com today. So they had never called me and told me that mm -hmm. they changed their mind and went with it. Mm -hmm. Crazy. That is Insane. Amazing. Yeah, and all that money started coming in. I had raised like, ten thousand dollars that day and for at the time that was like everything i was like oh my god my life has totally. changed you know like i'll be able to conquer the world with this ten thousand you know and uh, i have um and um so it was really yeah really really funny but where i really where where i was very fortunate is 
is CNN didn't have like they have this new product called CNN Heroes, and they didn't have um, you know they wanted to keep showing commercials for it and thing to build it up. Well, I was their only CNN hero. I was one of you know. <laughs> just a few so i was in like all their advertisements all the you know yeah. so all their commercials i was in it was just like non-stop commercials of myself i remember being in guatemala and it's like commercial of me on cnn you know like yeah. it was everywhere in, that's amazing the universe it, was like it was free everywhere and it was get constant media. you know and that like Help this man yeah i mean i yeah it was it was wild and that money and that yeah. money you know um my yeah that cemented my, you can you guys hear me okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, we can hear you okay yeah i just you, the screen froze a little bit um yeah so that money is really what uh you know helped me my friend when he gave me the three thousand dollars he said like i'll give you three thousand dollars until the day you die as long as you need it but as soon as that you don't need it anymore i'm gonna stop you just have to be honest with me about that and I was like, okay, that's a very fair, you know. And um, but then I was invited, and then of the twelve, and then of the scene in Heroes, the twelve, twelve scene in Heroes or whatever, they narrowed it down to who they let the country vote who they thought was the best one. And I was very fortunate enough that I got picked by the country or the world or whatever to be the best one. So that's what allowed me to go on Larry King. And the Larry King interview is what really, um, that interview, which you guys mentioned earlier, that interview is what gave me the money. Um, I had raised, I raised a hundred thousand dollars in that interview. By the time the interview was even over a hundred thousand dollars, it came into planting peace. Wow. And Incredible. that money is what gave me the money to like, you know, I was able to tell my friend Sean and the homeless boys, mm -hmm. I was like, Hey guys, you know, thank you so much for supporting me over the years, but I don't need the three K. <laughs> I don't need. I have money in the bank account now, and I don't think I need your support anymore. And 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 I and I've never had to go back and ask for money, you know, or you know. One thing you mentioned in not the Larry money King. from a standpoint of like going bankrupt or anything like that. What's yeah, that? one mention. One thing you mentioned in that Larry King interview, um, which is crazy that it's like eleven years old or something like that, or twelve <laughs> years old. It's um, a ways back. Um, you were talking about how you guys were actually deworming over twice as many kids as the UN yep. at that yeah. time. And uh, you know, tell tell us yeah. a bit about like the bureaucracy and like kind of the blockers and inefficiencies with some of the larger orgs compared to organizations like you. And feel free to also point people to other organizations that are doing it, you know, from that grassroots perspective um, really well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, or, you know, smaller organizations have their place and larger organizations have their, you know, have their place. Like, you know, a lot of organizations, you know, get, get, you know, frowned upon a lot, but they actually are very, very I think, very, very efficient. I, 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 you know, like Save the Children would be like one organization that I just think is incredible, you know, like what they, what, what they're able to pull off and the amount of staff they have around the world is just incredible. Um, but the, um, but I would say more so than like bureaucracy and the deworming, I, I would say more people that more, it was not bureaucracy, then it was just overlooked. Mm -hmm. Like people focus more on food aid, where I was like, eh, food aid isn't, I don't think food aid is the answer. It is a answer, but it isn't, isn't it, it isn't the answer. And, uh, and neither is deworming. Deworming isn't the answer, but deworming it to me is a lot. It's, it's more cost of, it's more cost efficient. Imagine it's, it's like what I said about the backpack. What about the, like what I said about the backpack earlier, like look what a hundred tons of food would look like compared to a hundred thousand doses of medication, you know, a hundred thousand doses of medication is like five to 10 backpacks, you know, where a hundred tons of food is a ship you know or <laughs> half a ship or whatever you know five containers and all of them and, and the food has its place i'm definitely not saying that food you know you know we shouldn't like feed the hungry or anything like that but but the problem also with food aids is that tw if if 20 if i ship in 100 tons of food 20 to 40 tons of that will be eaten by worms so it's very, you know, if 20 to 40 percent of a child's nutritional intake is being taken by parasites, you know, the nutrition, um, 
you know, I, I, it feels like it'd be smarter to deworm first. It's more cost effective. It's more, you know. Yeah, and I, I like your intentionality you, around logistics I promise and efficiency. You, and I'm not just, yeah. yeah, and I'm not just saying this. You can see, you can see children that are like lethargic. They're wasting away. They're slowly wasting away. They have no life in them and they're eating three times a day, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, a and 50 actually, survival rate to four years old, I feel like, tells a story as well as to how important it is. Yeah, like, I mean, feeding, of course, helps, but like, it's like they need like, you know, um, they just need that extra help. And when you deworm a kid and those worms leave their body within days, you can see a child coming back to life. Like, it is incredible. It blows, wow. it blows my mind, actually. Like, you're just like, wow, like this really is like a little magic pill. And, um, um, it's and, and it's also like, why the hell not? Like, it's so cheap. It gets the worms out of, them. well, then you have the people that will say, well, they just catch the worms again. Well, then you deworm them again. So you, you, the, the, the answer is, is deworming like twice a year. If you, there's a huge difference. What I always try to explain people, if a child catches a parasite again, an intestinal worm parasite again, yeah, that sucks. But, but having a little tiny parasite that you just drank in your body compared to having two years of parasites in you that have now grown to, you know, a six inch tapeworm. Oh and you have 20, I mean, a, a round worm, and you have 10 of them in your body, you know, compared to like a tiny little microscopic worm that you can't even see, um, you know, obviously the six worms, you know, the big worms are causing the damage. So if you deworm twice a year, it, it, you basically keep a child worm free from it causing, you know, the parasites causing any damage. Now we buy the medication just for pennies, you know? so. Yeah, of course it costs money to get the, you know, the logistics of it, but, but, but at the end of the day and what they're also spending, you know, like it, it's nothing, it's nothing and it should be done. So I would say it's not so much bureaucracy more so than it is like, it's just being overlooked. You know, I did a documentary sure. with like Discovery Channel or PBS, can't remember. And that was what the documentary was about. Like, it was like about like, why is Plenty Peace the only organization in the world out there like promoting this, you know, like, mm -hmm. why is this being overlooked, even though the evidence is in that like deworming is, is just so vital. Even I remember like, um, Bill Gates wrote a story through the Bill Gates Foundation. And he was like, uh, deworming is something the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is going to focus on. I'm not sure how we missed this. Like that was actually what they said, like literally used the word missed this. Like how the hell did we miss this one? Mm. You know? So, mm. yeah. So it's really, really important. You know, this guy and, sleeping on the floor of a homeless center caddying found that one somehow bill. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, I mean, there's also a lot yeah, of footage so, yeah. of you physically giving the medication to the children. So I'm sure that that you being on the ground and, administering the medication how was that for you i'm just curious to hear about that experience connecting with the kids too yeah it's kind of it, it's kind of interesting because you don't see the worms you don't see you go into a village and you deworm and then you leave you know so and it takes 24 to 48 hours for the medicine to work you know so you're not around you know i i heard a story about like one missionary and um in Africa somewhere, he like dewormed the village and then he came back the next day and they like, they chased him, you know, they were like, you know, thinking he was a witch, like this guy made worms shoot out of us, you know, like, <laughs> so, oh, wow. yeah, it's, um, I, I always warn people, especially if I go into like an orphanage or something, I'm like, oh, hey guys, like, just so you know, like all hell is about to break loose, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, your staff needs to be, you know, ready for what's Prepared. coming, you know, like literally. Like it, all hell is about to break loose. You know, these kids, some kids, obviously it's traumatizing and worms can also come through the mouth. You know, mm -hmm. most of the time it goes through the school, but like, yeah, it can be traumatizing. Obviously yeah. you look down and you see a bunch of worms. So, yeah. Was there almost an, was there yeah. an education process for, I mean, I know when you're really young, it's hard to understand, but I'm curious if there was any attempt to try and educate why we're doing this or, you know, what's. Yeah, not really. No, not really. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, so here's the thing, and it's not that I don't believe in education, obviously, like I believe in education and stuff, but here's the problem. Sometimes education, well, I mean, education is obviously always good, but obviously education takes time. 
And here's one of the things like I can tell people like, hey, you're catching worms because you're drinking bad water. You're catching worms because you're wearing you're not wearing shoes. You know, worms actually parasites can actually come in through the feet as well. So you're like so like because they're so microscopic. So it's like I if if they're not wearing shoes, me educating them about like, oh, you, oh, hey, drink clean water. You know, it's not they're like, oh, why didn't I think of that? You know, yeah. like I'll drink clean water for now on, you know, Haiti has the worst water in the world. So, mm. I mean, we'll tell them like if they were someone with an ass or if we're talking to a, a big group of people, I'll be like, yeah, this comes from drinking dirty water. You know, we'll just say it very briefly. To Melina's yeah. question, Aaron, about, you know, the kids and the connection and the kind of stories that you're seeing, you know, are you seeing that more so in the orphanages where kids are kind of growing up? in this better situation thanks to you guys what what are some of those moments say, say sorry say that one more time oh i understand the question yeah i was just going to ask more about um kind of like the impact of what you guys have seen so if you're not seeing the worms you know you've obviously seen oh, these okay. kids grow yeah. up in the orphanages and From like you know that that you guys provided shelter for them yeah yeah, believe it or not, my kids are in college now. You know, a lot of my kids are in college, you know. <laughs> um, they're, they're doing better than you did. <laughs> yeah, well, some of them. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, we have a lot. Of, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, like uh, some of the we have a lot of kids in college. The kids have opportunities. Um, you know, some we have to pay for college, some grant, grants that were given. Um, our scholarships, I should say. But yeah, that's really incredible to see, um, you know, to hear, um, you know, like just yesterday, you know, John was calling me and was like, oh, the kids, you know, they were, mis some of the kids were like misbehaving, you know, they're, they're like, you know, now the kids are like 19 or 20 years old. So I'm hearing it all, you know, so when you have a bunch of kids, obviously some kids are, you know, going to have their 20 year old moments and Oh, mm -hmm. this kid got caught drinking and this kid, got, you know, like these type of stories mm -hmm. or um, or, uh, you know, or, or the really, really positive ones were like, oh, so and so is, you know, uh, made straight A's. Yeah, it, it feels really good. It, it, I mean, obviously it feels good. I'm a proud parent, uh, you know, to see <laughs> these kids, you know, to see these kids do uh, so well and um you know, I mean, they're really, they really are just beautiful, really, really beautiful kids and to see what they've come from and how, how they've transformed. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, I'm just, I'm just really always proud of them. And, uh, you know, unfortunately too, I've like, you know, I've lost some kids, some kids, I've had children die on me. Um, you know, I recently had a child die that I'd been taking the, the, um, the first HIV child that I ever took in which was like four, I don't know, 13 years ago or something like that, um, you know, recently just died. Um, and, you know, that was really, you know, that that's really tough, obviously, you know, I've lost a couple of mm -hmm. kids, every, every kid I've lost actually was AIDS related um, that were in my homes. Um, so yeah, a lot of ups, a lot of, uh, a lot of highs, but, you know, I really see these kids as like family um, you know, one of the main, when I first started the orphanage, you know, if you go to like most orphanages in Haiti or anywhere around the world, you'll see like a name on the building. You'll see, you know, like a lot of stuff. We did put a name on the first building, but then we removed that. Um, like I really wanted to take like the program out of it. You know, I didn't want the kids ever to feel like they were in a program, you know, yeah. so so I never brought or familial donors. like we brought do we brought donors down like to visit the kids. But the kids, we've always made it the environment where the kids don't understand that, like, this is a person like supporting writing a check, mm -hmm. you know, um, you this know, and we've always man. made that like, yeah, we've always made that very clear when people coming in, you know, like. Um, and, and we haven't had many pump. It's not like, you know, some orphanages and I'm not blaming them. You have to do what you have to do to survive. We're just very fortunate that we didn't have to do it that way, you know? So, um, but yeah, long story short, I'm, I'm, it, it's really incredible to see, you know, some of these kids, you know, since I've had them since they were three years old, four years old, and now they're 18, 19 years old. Like, yeah, it's, it's, That's it's, so, it's, yeah. it's mind boggling. I just wanted to read a quick line before I check in if Scott and Ryan had any questions too. Um, 
you know, just to, to bring it back to show topic a little bit and, and thanks so much for sharing all this, Aaron, you know, all the religious traditions encourage service. Krishna taught karma yoga. That's the path of action. I would say Aaron is a karma yogi in many ways. Um, Buddha taught loving kindness. Christ says, what you do for the least of these, you do for me. He says, for I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. And then they said, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or give you something to drink? When did we, you know, house you do all these things? And he said, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. Um, you know, the Bodhisattva prayer is all about um, serving others until all beings are freed from sorrow. So, you know, what you're doing, Aaron, secular or otherwise, practical or uh, not lofty philosophical concepts, I know are not involved, but, um, but it is connected. It is integrated to um, the wisdom traditions in many ways. So um, from that place, I really just sincerely honor uh, all this work. Yeah. I also really appreciate the work you were doing. I was curious, uh, Bob mentioned it, but I was curious where the name came uh, or how you decided on it, Planting Peace. You know, I used to kind of stumble over his name. I always said Tana Hang until Bob corrected me, <laughs> or Tina Ha. I used to say, what when I used to say Tina Ha, and then someone came to me and said, no, it's Tana Hang. And I was like, okay. And then Bob, well, I don't even remember what, what do you, Han. how do you say his name, Bob? Thich Nhat Han. How do you say it? Thich Nhat Han. Thich Nhat Han. Han. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that, um, yeah. So I used to read one of, I, I used to read a lot of his philosophies and, um, I used one, my favorite book was a book called living Buddha, living Christ. And, um, mm -hmm. it was my favorite book. I would give it to people. And I just really liked the perspective of like this new, look and like you know how you know i'm sure if you guys have read his books or any of his books how he like breaks down like a christ you know especially in that book he'll like share a christ quote and like tell his perspective and i'm always like oh wow that's like a really incredible way of looking at it that's a new way of looking at it and i and i um i like that and um and so i really just started reading you know a lot of his philosophies and um felt empowered by by him and um, so, and if you've read his stuff, you know, the word planting, like planting the seed, planting, everything's okay. planting, planting, <laughs> hope, planting this, planting that, you know, so Nature I still have the, yeah, yeah, I still have the book and I remember like in my chicken scratch, you know, I would read the book and I would find little words mm -hmm. that I liked and I knew peace, you know, green peace was a charity that I liked. And I was pretty sold, I, not 100% sold, but I was pretty sold on the concept of like, I wanted peace in the word, you know, in the name, I, I'm, I'm sorry, peace in the name. And so, you know, I was, I was writing in the back of the book, I was taking little words, you know, out of that living Buddha, living Christ, you know, I took about like 20 words. Man. Hey, Aaron, yeah. Aaron, um, I wanted to see if you had a few more minutes, because uh, I, I wanted to hear your tales about um, Equality House, and particularly the Westboro Baptist Church, your former neighbors. So I want to jump into that if you have a few more minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So as you know, yeah, I live across the street from the Westboro Baptist Church. That's where our <laughs> charities. That's where our. <laughs> that's where wow. our charities. That's where our charities headquarters is, and um, I've lived there. Yes, yes. Two days ago, yesterday or two days ago was our eighth anniversary. I can't believe it's been that long. Um, yeah, so long story short, I was sitting at my, at my desk one night at my beach house in Destin, Florida, and, um, and I, um, it was like probably like two or three in the morning, and I kept reading these news articles about the Westboro Baptist Church. They were making the news over something. And I was like, who are these people? So I decided to Google them. I wasn't trying to get them or anything like that. I was just more, I'm a news junkie. I was more about just like trying to read the news mm. and, uh, and learn about them. So I Googled them and, and Google Earth popped up and was like, would you like to see you know, the Westboro Baptist Church? And I was like, oh, sure, why the hell not? So I clicked, <laughs> yeah. And as you know, you can be like the little Google, you know, like the little person 
I've never mm-hmm. even really done that before until that time. So I was like, you know, marching in front of their compound with my little Google Earth person. <laughs> and um, and it, and again, I had no intent. Like, oh, I'm gonna get these people. There was no, there was like none of that. Yeah, and just for it quick just, for quick context, the Westboro Baptist Church. If you're not familiar, they were they were a bit bigger in the news back when Fred Phelps was alive. I think he passed away, but I think the son is still involved. Anyway, they're this brutally intolerant Christian church. They show up pretty much at funerals of like the, the funerals of veterans they protest yeah. bi- and um they matthew shepherd's funeral matthew shepherd yeah they really uh, are particularly against gay people and lgbtq rights um, children that die with every, cancer they'll like yeah car crashes they'll, they'll protest slurs they protest go to hell they're very angry yeah. people they're very angry yeah people. their domain so, name yeah. is fag uh I think it is. Something, I think it oh, is fagsgotohell.com or something. Something you know, yeah. fags go to hell or something. Yeah. 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 Gosh, I can't even remember. It. Yeah. They're like clickbait yeah, they for intolerance. Big, they have, that big, they have yeah. the big banner on their on their um, you know across their church. You know, like fag yeah. marriage or whatever, whatever it's called. Um, and then they have a sign on their marquee that says "Fag Marriage Dooms Nation" right in front of me. And then they have another marquee that switches out usually to like a daily event. So like. If 9-11 happened, you know, they'd be like, oh, thank God the buildings fell. You know, like, it's always very, like, controversial. Right. Um, who do they – it's yeah. really confusing, like, who they're right. for. Even. is probably the good word. Yeah. It's like they're just trying to goad whoever they can. Yeah. Yeah, so I um, so I was using my little Google Earth um, person, and um, I did the – like, a, I, I'm from Florida, and in Florida we don't really have churches – in communities you know like it's not really a thing usually churches are separated from the community so Mm -hmm. i was already like from the get-go i was like oh wow like a church is right in the middle of a neighborhood like i don't you don't see that very often at least like how i see you know from my perspective and um and uh, so and i was like oh wow it's kind of like a quaint little neighborhood you know it's not i was picturing like fire you know like all the hell breaking loose i don't know you know i don't know what i was thinking but obviously something like not so quaint you know (laughs) and um anyways i um on my google earth i um with my little guy i was doing the 360 just to see the neighborhood and on the 180 of the 360 there was a for sale sign you know a for sale (laughs) sign right in front of the house you know right in front of the church and i was like i thought i the idea came to me right away i was like oh man that would be funny to buy that house and paint it the color of the pride flag. I was only looking at it from that perspective as something funny. You know, I wasn't like thinking of it like, oh man, kids are dying from, LGBT kids are dying from suicide. Let me do something for them. It wasn't really from that perspective. It was more like, that would be really to funny. Troll to them. That. Yeah, that would yeah. be really funny to buy that house and, you know, paint it the color of the pride flag. So um, I spent like the next hour or so moving my little guy trying to pull off the the name the the phone number off the realtor you know like whoever the realtor was and i couldn't get it just right i was like trying 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 and then finally i got it now it's like three in the morning and i called the number oh i'm goodness. thinking i'm calling like an office and i was just gonna leave a message <laughs> and i called in i called the number and the lady like answered you know like hello you know like all <laughs> like tired and i was like oh shit and i hung up you know i hung i hung up on the realtor and i was like oh man like i screwed that one up you know i can't call back the next day and act like nothing happened from my 850 area code you know it's not like she's receiving all of these calls from north florida so i uh, yeah i gave her i i just found another i googled gay realtor kansas found a gay realtor google tells you anything found a gay realtor in kansas <laughs> and uh called him up and i said hey he was in kansas city and i was like hey i would like to buy this house he didn't i didn't tell him where i didn't tell him it's in front of the westboro baptist church i just gave him the address he didn't know i knew he was gay Mm. and uh, why would he you know and uh so and then so he said oh i'm sorry i don't sell he lived in kansas city he was like on the kansas side of kansas city he was like i can sell all of them kansas but you should just contact the topeka broker and uh, I was like, okay. Again, he doesn't know that I know he's gay. Like, I need him. 
you know? And uh, so I just said to him, I was like, do you know of any gay realtors in Topeka? So now he's assuming I'm gay. And he <laughs> says to me, oh, so I'll never forget this. We're actually friends on Facebook now. And he was like, he was like, oh, son, if you're gay, the last place you ever want to move to is Topeka, Kansas, you know? Mm. That's what he said to me. And I was like, oh, wow. I was like, actually, I'm not gay. I was like, I was like, that address I gave you, I had, I go, that address I gave you is here. It's in front of the comp, Fred Phelps compound. I want to buy it. The I want to paint it the pride flag. And he was like, oh, my God, that's the best thing I've ever heard. I'll for sure help you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so when I bought the house, then I had never done anything in like LGBT, you know, I'm just a human right friendly. So of course that fits under that narrative. But, uh, but, uh, but then I started researching it and being like, wow, like a lot of queer and trans kids kill themselves due to suicide because the world just, is, um, you know, like they don't feel like they're a part of the world. And, uh, you know, that really, that really like hit home for me. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to do this, but with a mess, you know, like with a, Try to bring a message messaging to it uh but the idea at first was paint the house i sold the i called the planning piece board i told him what i was gonna do and i said look i'm gonna buy this house it was eighty one thousand dollars i'm just gonna buy the house i'm gonna paint it rainbow we'll announce that we're gay friendly <laughs> we're gonna push out this message about suicide in the, in the LGBT community, three months later, people will forget about the house. Six months later, we'll put the house back on the market and we'll get our money back. And we did this PR stunt to get our messaging out. So uh, they were like, okay. But what one thing that happened was, is that, that we never put into in our planning and my planning is that people were going to show up and start taking pictures in front of the house. You know, I had no idea the house was going to become I didn't know the house was going to become what it what it has become, you know. And uh, at first, you know, and I didn't know if the neighborhood was going to allow, like, you know, allow it. I swear to this story. Oh my gosh, did I had lived in the house three months before I painted it? I moved there on on December first, on January first, and it was still freezing out in Kansas, so you can't paint, you know. So I had to wait until March. That's why we painted in on March 19th, um, because it was finally like a sunny day in Kansas, a warm day in Kansas. But on March 18th, um, I got a, uh, the, uh, or let me just take one step back. In the neighborhood, all the homes, in the very direct neighborhood, all the homes are owned by the Westboro Baptist Church. Hmm. And 22 homes are owned by them. And the home right next to me directly is not, you know, so I was kind of like, oh, man, like what I, you know, like I felt bad, like I'm about to like start this human rights battle, right, you know, right in the middle of the street with this, with this guy, you know, about to pull this guy into that. The night before I painted, I had my mom was in my mom is an artist, so she was with me. She's the who picked out the colors. I was with my mom, <laughs> two Planting Peace staff members and myself, so three of us and a Huffington Post reporter. And we're all sitting huddled in the living room, no furniture, just around these chairs that I bought from Kmart or something. Buckets and I get Buckets a knock of on the door. Paint. We're like literally about to paint the next morning. We're like in our war, war plan meeting. I get a knock on the door and it's my direct neighbor. His name is Joe. And Joe handed me a bag of cookies and he said to me, I swear to this, he's, he handed me a bag of cookies with a note. And he said, I just want to thank you for being quiet neighbors. <laughs> my wife, when my wife saw that two young people moved in, we thought we there was going to be ruckus. But you're quiet. And uh, so yeah, cool. and, and he handed me a bag <laughs> of cookies. You know, so life was like slow motion as he was saying this. I was like, no, you know, oh like, God. why does he have to say this? So people often ask like, oh, were you scared of the Westboro Baptist Church? It's like, no, I was scared of my neighbor, Joe, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and then the next I day I painted and the next day I painted and thousands, I mean, it sounds like I'm exaggerating, but I promise I'm not like thousands of people just everywhere down the lot, like down the main road just parked you would like 10 15 minute walk people were parked so far back taking pictures 
media everywhere, probably like 15 cameras from, you know, sending reporters from around the world, sending camera crews to the film the house. And Joe at 5.15 in the afternoon is trying to pull into his house and he can't because it's blocked because of so many people. And I see, I'm doing an interview and I catch him pulling up in his little white car and I'm just like I can't even focus on the interview so there's probably like an interview out there somewhere of me like not looking into the camera but like looking thinking about left. Joe <laughs> looking at Joe as he pulled in and I can I see Joe roll down the window and he's telling people and he's like I live there like that's my driveway let me you know let me in and you know they parted the they parted the sea and he you know and he got in and he walked up to me and I was so scared. I was so scared of this guy. And he walked up to me and he was like, uh, he was like, oh, wow, I've seen you painted the house. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, Joe, I'm sorry, I couldn't tell you. And he was like, oh man, it looks really nice. And I was like, oh, wow, you think so? And he was like, yeah, he's like, yeah, I heard about it in the morning because he was like, he worked in a factory and someone had to come up to him and was like, hey, Joe, don't you live next to the Westboro Baptist Church? Like all hell is breaking loose you know, <laughs> at your house right now. So, um, yeah. That's and so then great. I came to him. Yeah, I came to him and I was like, um, I said, hey, Joe, this was like, you know, not not that minute, but, you know, like a couple months later. And he had never complained. We on average get 150 visitors a day. We were getting 150 visitors a day until coronavirus hit. Wow. So now is the visitors started picking up again, but you know I don't know, whatever. But Crazy. but uh, he um he um these people were like cut through his yard. You know they'll park down the street. People don't people want to park down the street because they want to take pictures and they don't want their car to be in the way. But unfortunately, people walk through his yard, mm. and he never complained one time. So I came to him and I said, "Hey Joe, if you ever sell your house, please tell me first, and I'll, I I will buy it. No questions asked. I will buy it." And I needed it too. Like one, I wanted him to do that favor because I was like, "Oh, poor guy. He might not ever be able to sell this house." And he had bought the house 22 years ago. Well, now it would be like 30, but at the time of painting, it was 22 years. And the church had radicalized 21 years. So he had lived there one year before the church had radicalized itself. So it wasn't like he moved into, you know, he just thought he was moving next to some Baptist church, right. a pretty little quaint little Baptist church. So he didn't, he didn't ask for any of it. Not you know? the source of um, bigotry and hatred in America. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or he didn't else. ask for any of that. So, so he came to me and he was like, Hey, you know, um, my wife has cancer and she can't walk up the stairs anymore. I have to buy a one story house. I'm putting it on the market. As you said, I would come to you first. And I was like, Oh, and you know, long story short, I bought it. And, uh, and we painted that the color. We, I don't know if you're aware of this, but every year, one, one week out of every year, there's a week for the transgender community. It's called transgender, transgender week of remembrance. And basically you remember all the people that were all the transgender people that were killed. You know, a lot of trans people were killed because of being transgender. And, and every year we would paint, we would take the pride colors off the house and we'd paint our color. We would paint our house, the trans flag. And, um, and there was a little girl named Avery Jackson and you can look her up. She's the first trans at the time. It wasn't like this, but she's the first transgender. Uh, actually, before I tell you this little fact, the, the child, um, uh, her mother came to the house, to the train, you know, when we painted the trans house, she's probably like at the time, like eight years old, nine years old, transgender. Her mother brings her here. She's from Kansas City. So they took that as an to be an hour away. She shows her the house. And, you know, and the reason she did that is she wanted to show her like, hey, you know, like people out there fighting for you you know like um you know it's a uh, like this is invisible you know you know just many different layers so why a, mother, a trans mother would want to show her this house that's painted the trans like well the little kid saw that and uh, i didn't know this at the time i learned this story later but the kid that day was like her mother was already an activist you know a transgender activist because of her child and um her mother or the child said mom will you take a picture of me in front of the house 
and post it on Facebook. And that was the very first time uh, that little Avery had ever had a picture taken of her, um, you know, like to visibly show the world that she was a you know, transgender. Well, fast forward a year and a half later, Avery was the first transgender person ever on the cover of National Geographic. So if you so if you look up Avery Jackson, our nationally transgender National Geographic, you can see little Avery with her with her uh, purple hair, dyed purple hair. Yeah. So uh, amazing, you know, pretty incredible. But I had reached out to Avery's mother. I'd reach out to I knew her mother was an activist and I didn't know that story. And then this is before the uh, uh, the Nat, Nat Geo thing. And uh, and I reached out to her and I said, hey, I'm going to buy this house next to uh, the equality house and I'm going to paint it the transgender flag. I know, you know, a lot of people in the transgender world. I need to raise like 80,000 bucks. Do you know anybody? And she was like, oh, why don't you let Avery help you and be a transgender uh, like uh, like a like the face of this? And I was like, and then she told me that story, you know, about coming over. I didn't know that story. And I was like, oh, wow, that really meant a lot to me because that's why I did it in the first place. You know, so when Accepting you hear these identity, stories, embracing identity, when you hear these stories, yeah. it made me feel really good. You know, I was like, oh, that's why I did the house in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, uh, you know, I announced to the world that I was buying the house and um, we had only raised like no one wanted to really give to it. Unfortunately, everybody. Uh, we raised the money in 24 hours. I had already bought the house, but when I painted the pride flag, people gave me the $83,000 I spent, you know, on GoFundMe right away on, uh, on, you know, the day of, through the media coverage, even more, even more. But when I tried to raise the money for the, I announced it beforehand for the transgender house, I had only raised 10,000, but it had made news in a, a news article when the New York Daily News had picked it up and a developer, a, 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 a developer in New York read the story and he called me and he was like, how much is that house? And I was like, $80,000. And he was like, I'll send you a check tomorrow. He's like, I want that little girl. He thought the house was for the little girl. He's like, I want that house. He's like, that little girl needs a house. So, so, I'll buy it for her. <laughs> so yeah, it was really nice of him. And, uh, wow. uh and I'm really Crazy. happy to have that because uh, uh yeah that's just yeah. one and of now the we many have pillars. Our refugee family. Yeah. We have a refugee family that lives in the house uh wow. from Aaron, uh, el salvador you do so El-Sal. much you do so much man um we're we're uh pretty close to time here i i'm this, these stories are all incredible and it's making me realize so i had like an agenda uh, of more questions that is like four pages long and i think we got through one page <laughs> yeah. so you you tell great stories though and it's been a joy to listen to all of them so you'll have to come back um mm -hmm. maybe yeah, later anytime. this year do like a part two with us that'd be so fun because i i, I want to hear more about um you know one thing you mentioned to me one time was your frustration with <laughs> like for example that it was buddhists killing muslims in myanmar that's a whole nother conversation yeah. that we'll have to cover yeah. um the dog rescue yeah i'll be um, more than we, happy to talk about that yeah yeah, yeah exactly let's let's tease a part two i think what i'd love to hear your last like few minutes on would be um to the listener and to us really also the beware out team um but just telling uh, us how to help like how you know for those for anyone listening that is inspired by your energy and um, your your capacity to make all this stuff happen. Like, I guess one would be how do we help planning peace, but also just generally. Yeah, um, yeah. For obviously anybody can come on to. Uh, first, thanks for having me. I really appreciate being on here and uh, telling these stories. So many of these stories I haven't told in. Whew. You know, I'm remembering I'm as so they glad. go. Oh, <laughs> like, oh wow, yeah, you know, like, yeah. yeah, it's refreshing now. I'm about. Yeah. yeah, I got. I'm about to write a book. I got approached by like a company, and Amazing. I'm busy. Yeah, so like this is a good uh, start to that. Um, remembering some of these. You needed stories. a long form. There's nothing long form online of you, so I was really thrilled to this, and that's why we need yeah. part two for later this year. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, yeah. So anybody can come on to plantingpeace.org, obviously, and make a donation. One thing about planting peace is I try to make. I, not every project, but uh, I try to make most projects where it's very tangible, you know, for $1, this is what you get, you know, of course, not every type of uh, project can be so tangible, you know, um, 
But uh, anyways, uh, yeah, if you want to support the deworming project, yeah, if you want to support the deworming project that we spoke about, you know, for one penny, we can deworm a child. Um, Yeah, so, um, so yes, anybody can come on uh, to our website. But in this general, I always just tell people like, you know, people have, uh, I think, a lot more power, you know, than they realize, you know, and I mean, and that's something I'm, you know, still learning, like what people can accomplish. And if you want to do something like really do it. And one thing I really suggest people, if I had to give like one lesson is really like, don't let other people tear you down. Cause here's the thing. Like when I first started telling people like, I'm going to start an orphanage, everybody said that's impossible, you know? And You're now I, I started four orphanage. I started four orphanages in Haiti and two in India, you know? Um, we lost two orphanages during the earthquake. So that's why we say we have two orphanages now. But, you know, when I said, I'm gonna, op- I'm gonna try to buy rainforest land to protect the Amazon, people say, oh, that's impossible. You can't just go to Brazil or Peru and buy Amazon. We now have 2,000 acres, you know. Um, when I said I'm going to deworm in North Korea, people said that was impossible. We dewormed, you know, 1 million people in North Korea, 22 million, 22, 23 million people around the world. Every time I've started, when I said I was going to launch the Equality House, oh, you're crazy. You can't just go into their community and do that, you know. And I still hear it. You know, the other day, when I, you know, I've been writing, yeah. I tend to be maybe a little too honest sometimes on Facebook and, you know, I'll write about like, Oh, my yeah, struggle. Aaron Jackson my... on Facebook is fantastic, by the way, not only should <laughs> so, you donate to planning peace, but also add him as a friend or follow him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, you know, I'll, I'll talk about like my struggles on, you know, like I've been, I, you know, if you've been, as you know, Bob, at like the You're getting vaccines weeks, was, like, to people post- right now, posting about my, my struggles of like trying to get this damn lawn mode. You know, and like right. my struggle is to get this 11 acre property mode, you know, and like, but what dogs. kind of, you know, just but be, being honest with people like, hey, y'all, I've never bought a lawnmower to mow 11 acres. Like, which one should I use? And, you know, these type of questions. And like, you know, like one of my friends approached me kind of rudely and was like, you know, um, you know, like, are you even basically, basically just directly said, like, do you even think you can like pull this off? You know, like, are you, you know, and I was like, and then, <laughs> Um, you know, and I was kind of taken aback by that, you know, that he would say that, but, and, and then one, another person wrote to me, you know, like, oh, do you even know what you're doing? You know, like another person also said that, and I, I was thinking like, to myself, you've like, never known what the you. hell, what the hell does a person have to do? Like, you know, one person wrote to me and said like, cause I, I have like this building right next to the house. And then I was like, and I, I posted like, oh, I'm going to put this dog, like, I'm going to maybe put dogs in this building. You know, and the person was like, oh, you can't, you know, very ma- a man. Ma- I don't know if a man can mansplain another man, but that's what the, per- you know, the guy was like, oh, Aaron, like really talked down to me. And was like, you don't even know what you're doing. Like the sun would beat down on that, you know, and it's like, dude, of course I would air condition it. Like, of course, I'm not going to leave dogs out in the sun, you know, like obviously, you know, <laughs> but my point to this is, is like people will will find a way to tear you down. You know, look, you know, not everybody, but a lot of people, I probably do it to people, you know, in some shape or form, you know, try not to, but I'm sure I have, I'm sure somebody out there could give an example of me tearing them down or or some, or some shape or form, but like, but don't listen to people, you know, I, um, have you guys ever read, have have you ever read the book or seen the documentary Finding Joe? Have you guys ever seen Uh, that documentary? No, but it's about Joseph Campbell, right? Yeah, that's a documentary, especially you guys definitely should. It's a life changing documentary. You know, it's about the Joseph Campbell philosophy, Mm -hmm. you know, his main, uh, the hero's journey. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. Just watch the trailer and you'll tear up. Like, it's, (laughs) it's, it's probably the best document. If I were to live and I'm a documentary, like, Mm -hmm. I've watched a lot of documentaries. I've watched Power of Myth of his like 12 times. Yeah. I would pretty, I would probably say it's the best documentary I've ever watched. Wow. Wow. And I would I would probably put it in the number one spot. And I always suggest this documentary to people that are like so many people come to me and like, oh, Aaron, I'm lost. Like, what should I do? I want to do this, but I'm not feeling confident. I'm like, watch Finding Joe. You'll get pumped up. But in this documentary, <laughs> you know, they talk in this documentary. 
they this person is talking about a monk and i don't know who the monk's name is or anything like that but the monk says you know like if you're if your village isn't laughing at you at least once a week, you're doing life wrong. You know? <laughs> and I don't know who said that, but I think about that a lot. You know, so I was going to say yourself... it's almost like, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it's almost like for you, if it's like an indicator that you should do it, it's what it sounds like. The naysayers are like your your indicator that this is worth pursuing. Like if people were like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea, Aaron, I feel like you would start to question that <laughs> yeah yeah you yeah, need yeah, the haters yeah. no exactly and um but i think about that a lot you know when someone is making fun of me or whatever like or or whatever you know i you know i get that a lot you know i'm not just from conservatives but because you know conservatives really come after me on facebook as you know bob and social media um but uh because of all the lgbt rights stuff that we do sure but um uh, that but that would be like my one. I know them. I kind of just went off on the tangent. That wasn't very short at all. But yeah, that would be like my no, one thing great. is like really just um, kind of sounds cliche, but like you know just do it and like and don't worry about like what other people think or do or, or whatever. Because like I I really believe in intent. Like I'm I'm an atheist, but if you were to like, what's your main like thing? I would be like intent. You know, I, I really believe in the power of intent and, you know, also like, you know, and, and within intent, I believe in the power of just putting something out there. You know, you put it out there, see what the hell comes back, you know, and, uh, and you're I really proof. believe in that. Yeah, yeah. I, I really, I really believe in that, you know, like doors will open, you know, and, um, and uh if you keep pushing at it you know like doors will open so if you're if someone's out there trying to like start a project and no one's paying attention or people think it's silly like don't worry you know silly is not doing it you know silly is not is uh giving up on yourself you know so and uh but there's a lot of things you know people can do to help their community and and everything doesn't have to be big you know like just because there's a famine going on in somalia or or yemen doesn't mean that you have to solve the famine you know just do it just do what you can whether that's sending in 25 dollars a month or figuring out another uh you know another path so it's um really amazing um your that idea of intent and how that it feels like it has really driven everything for you. And I've just been, yeah, noticing all the little synchronicities that have happened in your journey, just like moments that, um, you know, didn't totally make sense at the time, but you were just like listening to what was happening in your life and just following that and just kept following yeah. it one after another. And it all just has continued to unfold for you. And I think there's a lot to be said about, following that and it just it just feels like there's a lot of you know where you're just like following your heart and following your passion and it's a really really incredible story of yeah and just i'm just amazed at your grit and determination and selflessness like opening here, here. an orphanage <laughs> while living in a homeless shelter like that just like that money you could have been paying you know buying an apartment or renting an apartment but you're just literally sending it away it's just really really uh incredible really inspiring story Absolutely. yeah I appreciate, yeah i appreciate it yeah and you're right and, and what you said is right yeah i feel like yeah if you just listen and uh um and you know things have just it's it's amazing how some things like have come to um fruitation and how doors have opened up you know i'm gonna before i go i'm gonna tell the quickest story um and uh, something I just thought of when I was when I was opening that uh, when I was going to Haiti for that very first time to do that medical program, I remember how I told you I would have um, to feed the children. You know, I was going to have to feed feed the kids, and uh, they told me before I went there it was going to be two thousand dollars. But at the time, I, I I was two days away. I was like forty eight hours away from getting on a plane and going. And I had not had that $2,000 yet to feed those kids. I didn't know where the hell the money was going to come from. I was, I don't know if I was stressing. I, you know, I was like, oh man, this is a mess. Well, well, um, I used to give tours at the homeless shelter. 
and I left a homeless shelter to go back to my Miami apartment that Trump took away from me. And my girlfriend, <laughs> Corinne, says to me, hey, I left my purse at the place. We have to turn around. OK, sure, babe, let's go. We turned around. I went and got she went and uh, ran back into the homeless shelter. And as she was in there, a phone call came in for a person that would like a tour, you know, to see the facility. And she said, well, Aaron's not here right now. Come back tomorrow and um, and Aaron will give you a tour. So when she got back in the car, she's like, hey, somebody's going to come in tomorrow to give a tour. Perfect. The next day I'm at the shelter. Somebody comes. Um, um, this lovely lady comes, this lovely African-American lady. She comes, uh, an elderly lady. I give her the tour. She's probably like 60 or 70 years old. And I tell her, yeah, I'm going, you know, I'm all excited. You know, I'm again, I'm like, what, 22 years old, 23 or something. I'm like, I'm going to go to Haiti, you know, like da, 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 da. And she's like, oh, wow, that's amazing. And I was like, yeah, I was like, I got to feed these kids, though. I was just telling her, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do that. But, I, you know, and I, it was, I kind of just said it in passing, you know. And, um, and usually it's customary. Not everybody did it, but it was customary that when you – when I give the tour, somebody would give like a donation and usually it'd be like $5, $10. And um, this lady uh, wrote, handed me a check and she folded it and she handed me a check and she said, um, um, this is for you. I don't have much money. She's like, I'm very, very, very poor actually, but I had just sold my house and I'm downgrading my house. And, uh, but this is for you. I, I had had a conversation with God like a week ago that I want to feed some kids with this money. And, um, and, uh, so you just opened up a path for me and she handed me the check. Now I'm thinking this is going to be like 50 bucks. I opened the check and, um, and it was for $2,000. I never even told her an amount or oh anything like that. And it was the exact amount that I needed to feed those kids. Oh my now God. I'm, an, I'm an atheist, <laughs> you know, but I, in that moment I was Christian, you know, I was, uh, I was as Christian as Christian could be. Cause she was like one of these, like I'm doing it for Jesus. And you know, and I'm not, I don't care. That was great. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, of course, I'm not going to say anything about that. And that's awesome for her. I have nothing negative to say about that. But in that moment, you know, <laughs> you question like, your, yeah. Yeah, like the vibrations and, uh, uh, you know, that you ever have like just something amazing happen suddenly and you just like feel it in your body. I don't I don't even know how to explain it, but yeah, I, totally. there's probably not even words you can put to it. You have to yeah. experience it. But, you know, yeah, and uh, beautiful. And that, but I was levitating. I was levitating. <laughs> You know? <laughs> literally i was probably like two inches off the crown you know? <laughs> i was so happy and i couldn't believe it and, it and it was for the exact amount that i needed and maybe it was coincidence or maybe it was intent you know i would like to believe in intent you know that you can fill that. your own path beautiful in some shape or form I'm, you know i'm so glad you fit that into at the end yeah Aaron jackson <laughs> plantingpeace.org um, yeah. This is part one of five, maybe. I don't know. Come <laughs> back and tell us a bunch more stories. Um, good luck with all you're doing, man. We really yeah. appreciate you sharing. And, yeah, uh, I appreciate you guys, and I appreciate everything you guys do. And so uh, cool. yeah, I look forward to coming back and just, if anything, just remembering some stuff. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we're the we're the uh, biography blueprint or something. Like <laughs> yeah. That. Exactly. Yeah. Thank. Yeah. I, I appreciate you guys, and you guys have That's a. Uh, a wonderful Sunday. Thanks, brother. Yeah, Likewise, you too. It was really well. great meeting you. Yeah. <laughs> nice meeting you guys. Bye. Bye.